sorry about the short break, but I, I don't really know how long it will take to get through all three topics. I didn't want to take a long break and then find out later we needed five minutes or ten minutes at the end. Hopefully, we'll be through all three handouts um, by like this time next week. Um, and then we'll have a little time for a review or question and answer, but I, I just don't know how long it roll, takes to roll it all out. I'm thinking since I took a little more than an hour and a half the first time, maybe um, w we need the time. So here's a sort of a glossary, and I'm only going to read this, this stuff, but basically these are some of the terms we're going to talk about. Uh, if you have a sense of uh, comfort with these terms at the end of our discussion, uh, as you get ready for the exam, you'll be in pretty good shape. Um, so the last discussion we had was where can I put my drugs? So uh, again, drugs usually work by competing with a, or taking the place of an endogenous ligand by altering the normal ligand receptor interaction. So we talked about normal ligand receptor interaction up until now. Now we're going to talk about how we're going to hang drugs in there and also then how we're going to describe different kinds of drug effects. Because not all the drugs that hang onto a receptor are going to do the same thing as the ligand. Some will activate it, whoa, really well, like the ligand maybe. Some will activate it, maybe not so much. Some won't even activate it at all. They just sort of sit there and blah. And some will bind it and go the other direction. And so we have to talk about all those kinds of things and how those kinds of things can happen. Um, um, this is a quote from the text. I'm not sure I believe it entirely, but a drug generally makes only a quantitative change in an existing physiologic effect. It doesn't qualitatively ex explain anything. I think that's really hard to sort of fathom. I'm a neuro guy. So how does, what is LSD like? I mean, what's the normal process that's like LSD? I don't think people have that. Um, if you've read about LSD, you, sort of would see, you might agree with what I was saying. Anyway, by and large, though, drugs just fit into this physiologic framework. Um, this is sort of a, a cartoon. It's a simple cartoon. It's from the old story. This is what we talked about before, uh, ligand receptor interaction. That's a receptor. This is a ligand. It's going to bind to the receptor. Now it's going to produce some kind of conformational change, and then there's going to be a response, and the ligand is going to jump off. The conformational change is going to be a little wiggle. Was that exciting or what? <laughs> then the ligand leaves. So that's sort of where, what, we, what we've talked about before. That's all of chapter 12. Got it? Okay. Um, now we'll go to chapter 13. Now we're going to talk about a drug. In this case, a drug is an agonist. A drug is an agonist, and we'll, do, we'll, we'll define this more thoroughly later, but an agonist is a, is a drug that mimics the ligand in terms of binding to the receptor and activating the receptor and producing a similar kind of a response. So it's not the endogenous ligand. This is now a drug. It's going to go in there, bind to the receptor, and it's going to produce some kind of activation, then it's going to jump off, and that's how a drug works. So that's, kind of, that's the old framework. There's one thing we're going to talk about how that framework is not quite uh, entirely correct, and we're going to spend quite a bit of time about that, but that's sort of like, that's how the drugs are working, uh, at least according to the old school. So what, so we're going to talk now about, first we're going to talk about what's called the two-state model for, for uh, essentially for receptors. And we're talking about agonists and antagonists and allosteric drugs. That's, a lot of our time we'll spend on this stuff. But the two-state model essentially says it was a little bit of an oversimplification of what I just showed you. I showed you a receptor just sitting there kind of like, la, 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 I'm waiting for a ligand, waiting for whatever, and a drug binds to it. And then the receptor gets activated and you get an effect. The two-straight model says, you know, really, receptors aren't as boring as we thought they were. They're not just sitting there 100% of the time inert, waiting for either a ligand or a drug to activate them. The two-state model says that sometimes receptors are in an active state without any ligand, without any drug. And sometimes they're in an inactive state. If a receptor is in an active state, even without the ligand, you can get a response. Now, we didn't know that for a, a probably about, um, maybe about 15 years ago, it started, maybe 15, 20 years ago, some research started to suggest this. It really came out of molecular biology research. Basically, with molecular biology, you can overexpress a receptor system. You can pull a receptor system out of a cell, put it in something else, and overexpress it. You in molecular biology techniques know you, you have a cell that's got tons and tons of this receptor. And even if you don't have any ligand there, 
And this was done with GPRCs, uh, G protein coupled receptors. Even if you don't have any ligand there, you will get some degree of a response, a modest response just from the receptor alone. And that has led us to say, well, we can't just say the receptors are always some kind of blah, 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 inert, waiting for the ligand or the drug kind of a thing. Sometimes the receptors can do what they're going to do even without the drug. And that's called the activated form of the receptor. And then there's the not activated form of the receptor. And in the, in the text and in the, in the handout materials, R with an asterisk is a receptor that's in the activated form, can do its thing. R without the asterisk is the inactivated form. And essentially, two things to note. One is the receptor can go to the active form in and of itself. Not very often, but it can. And so now we're going to say, instead of the drug being something that comes over and says, hey, let's get active, what the drug does is talks to all the receptors and says, hey, let's have more active receptors than we had before, in the case of the normal ligand or in the case of a drug agonist. So you got to understand that they're inactive and active states. In the inactive state, you're not going to produce an effect. In the active state, you're going to get a biological effect that's produced. And again, we had to change this thinking because using what are called constitutively expressed re receptors, a, a, a single receptor way overexpressed in the cell line of some kind, you can show that you can get a response from a receptor without the ligand being present. So the receptors have that capacity. The ligands, what they do, the natural ligand tends to shift the balance from inactive to active. So you have more active receptors. So you get a bigger response with the endogenous ligand. Drugs that we call agonists, which mimic the endogenous ligand, again, shift the proportion so you have more active receptors. Drugs that are called antagonists will bind to the receptor and won't change the balance. And they'll also prevent other things from binding. And then, and we'll, we'll get to these in, in a little bit later, there are drugs called inverse agonists, which simply bind to the receptor and move it away from the active state, if it was already active, to the inactive state. So they actually undo the normal thing that the receptor's doing. They work counter. And all this came, again, um, really out of, out of the last 15 to 20 years of molecular biology work, starting with G-protein coupled receptors, extended to other kinds of receptors. Constituent receptors, essentially, this is sort of overexpressing them. Even in the absence of the ligand, with the receptor alone, you can get an effect, if you have enough of it. And so what, we've, what the, the new thinking is that ligands and drugs change the balance between the inactive conformation of the receptor and the active conformation. And this is a picture of it. And this is from your text. Up at the top, we've got this balance going on between R without an asterisk, that's the inactive form, and R with an asterisk. A drug can bind either one. If the drug binds the inactive form of the receptor, you get no effect. It's just drug receptor binding, and you might have some consequence, but you don't actually have a consequence in and of itself. If the drug binds the active receptor, you're going to get an effect. Some drugs, in fact, all the drugs we're going to talk about, theoretically will affect this balance between R and R+. An agonist at a receptor is a drug that not only binds to the receptor, but it shifts the balance toward the active site. And so it's going to produce the effect because it brings more receptors to the active state. An inverse agonist, and I've used this term once now and we will define it eventually, is actually a drug that says, okay, if you have this normal physiologic balance between some active and some inactive, I'm going to push toward the inactive state. So I'm going to undo, I'm going to oppose the normal actions that that receptor produces. That's an inverse agonist. And an antagonist molecule is going to simply bind to those two receptors, those two conformations, and it won't change the, the nature of the conformation. It doesn't turn it on or turn it off, but it does occupy the receptor, so it prevents anything else from occupying and changing that receptor. And we'll get into that in a lot more detail later. But that's the two-state model.
And you have to bring that into play to talk about agonists, antagonists, and inverse agonists, and things like that. So that's the two-state model. Now we'll talk about drugs. And, and the book talks about agonists, partial agonists, inverse agonists, and antagonists. I'm going to add at some point in the lecture what are called partial inverse agonists, too. We're going to come back and hit this many, many times over. Yeah, question. Um, the, the previous example, I'll go back one, sorry. Oops. An antagonist molecule, an antagonist molecule, we're going we're to get into this in more detail, is a drug that will bind to both conformations, both the inactive and the active form of the receptor. It won't change the balance at all. So it doesn't do anything by itself, but if there's a normal ligand kind of trying to move toward the active site, it will prevent that because it blocks the occupation by other, other kinds of drugs, whether they're agonists or inverse agonists. But in and of itself, an agonist, an antagonist molecule will have affinity, will bind to either set, state of that receptor, doesn't change that balance. So now we're going to talk about agonist, antagonist, and partial agonist, and inverse agonist. We've already introduced the terms. So, so all this stuff, whether it's an agonist, a full agonist, or a partial agonist, or even an inverse agonist, an agonist is a compound that binds to the active receptor and stimulates a response characteristic of that receptor that is characteristic of it when it's acted by its normal endogenous ligand. So an agonist is a drug that mimics the endogenous ligand. If I give isoproterenol, which is a beta agonist, and it goes and activates a beta receptor on the heart, Isoproterenol will mimic the effects of the norepinephrine to produce this tachycardic response. What it does is it changes the balance between the active and the inactive form. An increased agonist binding causes more receptors to move from the inactive to the active form, which increases the response generated. That is to say, if it's an agonist compound, it will come in and say, okay, here's the normal balance. Some activated, some not activated. I'm going to move that, I'm going to shift that balance toward the active form, the R star form, and that will increase the likelihood of having an effect of mimicking the ligand, if it's an agonist. And we're going to have two, well, two sort of levels of agonist. One is what's called a full agonist and one's called a partial agonist. A full agonist is a molecule that's going to go in there and bind and essentially push almost all the receptors to the active form. Full agonist converts all the receptors to the active form. The drug's attraction to the, the, the R star form, the active form, is highly preferential over the attraction to the, the unactivated form. Theoretically, the receptors shift to the active form, and now you activate, you have all the receptors activated. That's what a full receptor does. It moves that balance so that all those receptors are now in the active form and now you're getting maximal activation of that receptor system. And this is whether it's a GPRC or a ligand-gated channel or whatever kind of thing it is. So that's a full agonist. A partial agonist is conceptually not too hard to handle. That's sort of like a weak agonist. Something that can bind the receptors both in the active and in the inactive state. But instead of pushing all of them to the active site, it pushes more to the active site, but not necessarily all. It leaves some in the inactive state, so it's not going to produce as big a response at that individual receptor as a full agonist would. Partial agonists will bind to that receptor, and we'll talk about how we measure that. It'll bind to that receptor, it will activate that receptor by moving it toward this active, active formation, but it won't have the magnitude or the degree of activation that the full agonist has. Yeah, question. Is it a function of it not being an actual <coughs> ligand, or is it sometimes intentional that it does that? So like it wants to elicit a response, but not necessarily all the way, or is so, it because it's not what it's supposed to So the question is, is a partial agonist some failure? <laughs> 
uh, inadequacy of, of, of the molecule. Um, I don't think we would call it that way. It, you, you got the concept that it doesn't produce the same magnitude of activation as a full agonist. And in many instances, or at least in some instances, maybe that's what you want. You don't want a hammer. You want to just tap around the edges a little bit. And a partial agonist can bind to the receptor, move maybe some, maybe some, some of the receptors move to the active conformation and you get a bigger effect, but you don't get the full, full maximum effect. Sometimes the full maximum effect of activating a receptor might be too much. And so a partial will get you a smaller response typically, and we'll talk about spare receptors on Wednesday, but uh, by and large a partial agonist will give you a smaller response, but that might be what you want. You might want to tweak the system rather than pound it. But asking the question shows that you got where we're going. So that's a partial agonist. Inverse agonists, I've used this term a couple times now, you probably never heard of the term inverse agonist, I don't know if you've heard partial agonist before either. Inverse agonist is a drug that produces its action which is opposite the agonist. From a binding perspective, the inverse agonist preferentially binds to the inactive state, the R without an asterisk state, and that essentially shifts the balance to more and more of those inactive states of the receptor, so you have less and less of the active form, and so now you're undoing whatever that receptor is normally trying to do. So an inverse agonist binds to the receptor, but instead of making it move toward the active conformation, it moves toward the inactive conformation, and it essentially undoes some of what that normal receptor might be doing. We'll talk about inverse agonists. There aren't too many drugs out there that are used specifically for their inverse agonist properties. There's some, and we'll talk about those in a little bit. And probably not till Wednesday, to be honest. Antagonists, and I said this already, antagonists are molecules that will bind to the receptor. They will bind to both the active and the inactive form equally well. They're not gonna shift the balance between active and inactive. They're simply going to bind to that receptor. But by binding to that receptor, they're going to do a couple things. One is they're not going to change the balance of power, if you will, between having an effect and not having an effect. But they will also prevent other molecules from binding to that receptor. And that may give you an effect. I think uh, someone over here asked a question uh, last week about when you give a receptor blocker like a like a propranolol. Propranolol is a beta receptor blocker. It can block beta 1 receptors. What happens if you're measuring heart rate is you'll get a reduction in heart rate. But that's not because propranolol is directly slowing the heart. Propranolol is occupying the receptors that are normally occupied by that endogenous ligand norepinephrine and preventing that action. So it's not that antagonists don't have any outcomes, but it's the case that they don't change the balance between active and inactive receptors. They simply bind and prevent almost anything else from binding there uh, because they have typically higher affinity. And we'll talk about affinity in a little bit. They have higher affinity for the receptor than the agonists. So they don't alter the receptor activity on their own, but they can compete with a natural ligand or with agonists, with partial agonists or even inverse agonists for the receptor, and thereby they competitively block the response elicited by those drugs. And we'll talk about that in more detail. One of the major utilities, it says the primary clinical utility of, of antagonists is to decrease the ability of endogenous ligands to produce a biological response. If a person has a cardiac, some kinds of cardiac arrhythmia, they're given propranolol because it can block the effects of norepinephrine. And that's not because propranolol is activating any receptor. It occupies the receptor. It doesn't change the balance between active and inactive. But it will also block the ability of the normal ligand, norepinephrine, or some endogenously administered drug, like isoproteranol, to produce its effects. Now that's surmountable, and we'll talk about that issue a little bit later on. But essentially an antagonist binds to that receptor, 
shifts the balance between or does not change the balance between the active and the inactive receptor, but it will prevent the actions of the endogenous ligand, it will prevent the actions of an agonist or a partial agonist or even an inverse agonist. So this is what we've got, and I've added one here to the, to the crate. Um, essentially, I've already said all this. Full agonist converts virtually all of the uh, uh, drug receptor um, uh, binding combinations to the active form to achieve maximal effect. That's a full agonist. Partial agonist increases the active to inactive ratio, but doesn't push it to the max. Full inverse agonist converts all the active form to the inactive form to undo whatever is going on. There's a thing called a partial inverse agonist, just to sort of balance out the whole thing. That's something that can bind to the receptor, pushes it toward the inactive form, but is not fully inactive, just more inactive than it was before that drug was given. And then there's the antagonist, which binds to both forms of the receptor, the active and the inactive form, doesn't change the balance, but it does prevent the, either the endogenous ligand, the normal ligand from doing anything, and it prevents a lot of drugs from binding there as well. And this is another picture of it. Um, and I think this is from Goodman and Gilman. Um, but essentially, what you've got is receptor activity. If you've got sort of a, the normal receptor activity, so this is the balance between the active and the inactive form, and you've got a line of 100% there. That's sort of the before you give me any drugs kind of thing. You've got the normal state, and you've got drug concentration on the x-axis. If I give an antagonist across a wide range of doses by itself, in terms of what it does to this active versus inactive conformation, it doesn't change it. Antagonist, you get 100%. You get no effect on that balance between active and inactive. That's what we said before. If you give a full agonist, you push that effect toward the active receptor. In this case, you go from 100% up to 200%. That represents virtually all of the receptors being converted to the active side and producing an effect. Partial agonist is almost, but not as good as a full agonist. It pushes it up maybe to 150%. Partial agonists are anything that can range from, you know, even a 10% increase to about a 90% increase. So there's a range of partial agonists. This is one in the middle in this case. But basically, if it changes the conformation from inactive to active, it's an agonist. If it does 100%, it's a full agonist. If it only does something less than 100%, it's a partial agonist. Inverse agonist is pictured here. That moves the conformation virtually down to zero. That is, converts all the receptors to the inactive form. And they, this, this graph doesn't have it, but a partial inverse agonist would be right in between the antagonist and the full inverse agonist. All this is is how these drugs are changing this balance between the active and inactive form of the receptor. Because the active form of the receptor is going to lead to the response. <laughs>